Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, you saw a long list of participants in the program and uh, all of them, I want you to know that all of them participated in creating this uh, presentation on the bilingual experience uh, for our students at John Jay. But unfortunately, uh, they all moved on to new jobs or new, they graduated uh, and only one of them will be with us presenting. He's on his way to work. He took time off to be able to present and be here with us. And he will be joining us very soon. So for those of you who don't know me, I'll introduce myself. My name is Cristina Lozano Arguelles, and I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Modern Languages and Literatures. And even though I teach translation and interpreting here at John Jay, my research is on bilingualism. And I was fortunate enough to be able to teach a course on the bilingual mind for the honors program last semester. And I've noticed that many of these topics are interesting for uh, both professors and students, and I end up talking about them in the hallways. So I thought that this would be a good venue for me to share a little bit more with you. And these were the students that uh, presented, uh, that they created this presentation and actually presented their research projects last May. And uh, I wanted to start asking you who counts as bilingual? What is a bilingual? And if you could please type your answers in the um, chat. There are no right or wrong answers, but I want to know how you think about bilingualism. And I see that little Daniel is joining us too. <laughs> Robert is saying, those who think and speak and relate to the world in two languages and cultural points of reference. Dustin saying, people who are able to communicate fluidly in two different languages. So we see a little bit of nuance there. You have to communicate fluidly. Alison um, is the capacity to speak uh, with understanding and fluency two languages. Okay, so I see that for some of you, the uh, fluency is a requirement to, to be considered bilingual. And the truth is that um, true bilingualism is a myth. Most bilinguals are dominant in one of their languages and they are still bilingual. We do not have one uh, monolithic definition for bilingualism, but we have categories to distinguish between different types of bilingualism. So we can talk about different types of bilinguals depending on their age of acquisition. They could be early or late bilinguals, depending on their proficiency in each of their languages. Uh, they could be beginning, intermediate or advanced, depending on how dominant they are, if they are more dominant in one of their languages. For example, I'm dominant in Spanish, but uh, some bilinguals are very balanced between um, both of their languages. And we can also distinguish different types of bilinguals depending on their production skills. So some bilinguals are going to be able to produce both of their languages, whereas some of them can understand two languages, but only produce one. And you can probably think of some cases among our students where they are able to understand Spanish, but they cannot produce it. And they would still be considered bilingual because when we look at their minds and the way their brains process language, they are different from our monolingual students. So I don't want you to think about bilingualism as a switch that you either turn on or off, but rather as a dial. And uh, as we will see during this presentation, bilingualism is a fluid and dynamic experience. So I can be one type of bilingual now, I can be just uh, receptive, but if I keep working on my language skills, I will become maybe uh, a balanced bilingual. 
okay? So this would be a way of visualizing different types of bilinguals on the spectrum. Uh, on the top part, we uh, talk about early bilinguals, so those who acquire both languages roughly before the age of five. We don't have a cutoff, but in research, we, we talk about five as a, a milestone. They can be receptive bilinguals. Like I said before, they only produce one language, but they are able to understand two languages. Uh, we usually talk about heritage speakers here in the context of the U.S. because many of them have acquired the one of their languages in the home setting. And then when they are socialized, they start acquiring English, usually before the age of, of five. And uh, some of them are balanced bilinguals. They are equally proficient in both of their languages. And then for late bilinguals, like my case, I learned English later in life. Uh, we can talk about different types depending on their proficiency levels. If you're just starting your um, bilingual journey, you would be at the beginning, lower end of the, the spectrum. And if you've acquired an advanced level, like hopefully I've um, done, uh, then we would consider you advanced. Okay, so you see that this is a very complex um, phenomenon that we have here, bilingualism. And I'm going to admit Javier to the room. And I wanted to start talking about bilingualism and racism because uh, I don't think many people connect both of them, but they are actually very connected and you will see why. So I wanted to share this tweet with you. It's, it's old, this girl is probably like a teenager now, but Princess Charlotte already speaks two languages at just two years old. What do you think of this kid? Um, if you could please type your responses in the chat. It's a well-resourced kid, a very privileged coddle. So I think we, we all agree that it's great that she and Nicholas is here. I'm going to admit him. We all agree that it's great that she's learning two languages. Um, Ellis is true of many children, but this one is famous and she's been not being pushed to prioritize English. And that is exactly uh, the answer that this piece of news got on Twitter. So do most children of uh, immigrants, but I guess it's less impressive when they are poor. OK, and this is because um, we see bilingualism differently depending on the color of our skin. Often for white bilinguals, they are praised. Um, they are seen as going above and beyond and they are seen as a competitive candidate. Whereas for bilinguals of color who bring that gift of knowing two languages from home, uh, we see them uh, as a problem that requires creating policies to um, remediate that, that problem, right? So we need to correct or improve their second language. Uh, they are put to in remedial English as a second language programs. And society doesn't really value that uh, heritage language that they bring to the table. And uh, now we're gonna move on to uh, a myth um, bilingual children get confused. So I wanted to also ask you, is it dangerous for kids to be raised with two languages? Will they get confused? What are your thoughts on, on this? And maybe like we're a small crowd, if you prefer to open the microphone and, and say it rather than type, uh, you can also do that. The world is confusing, bilingualism is clarifying. I like that answer, Robert. So what happens because, you know, when two, um, um, a, a child is learning two languages, sometimes they mix them. So they are using one language and all of the sudden they will say a word in the other language. Even I was talking this past weekend to a two-year-old who speaks English, Spanish, and Russian. 
and I was speaking Spanish to the little girl. And all of the, the sudden, she said a Russian word to me. Will you think that she was confused? Um, so Alison says that uh, it's a great advantage. Uh, Tim says, absolutely not. Just like children are not confused between the many Englishes they learn, early age language users are extremely adaptive. Okay. Uh, and Dustin says, I think children have enough awareness to know when they should or need to use a specific language. Exactly. And this is exactly what um, is going on with children that mix two languages. Sometimes they, they are learning languages. A two-year-old doesn't have a very large vocabulary. So when they don't know a word in one, the language they are speaking, but they know it in another language, um, they would just use that resource that they have, okay? So mixing languages is different from being confused, okay? Bilingual adults mix their languages all the time. I have some bilingual colleagues from my department here. And we, even though we're all dominant in Spanish, we live in an English dominant society and some words come faster to our minds in English and we just say them. And that doesn't mean we're confused. We're very aware of what we're doing. And code switching, this going back and forth between, uh, I see Alison is skeptical about <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, code switching, so going back and forth between our languages is natural in bilingual communities. And this doesn't mean that we're speaking uh, broken languages. It just means that we are using all the resources that we have here in our minds. Um, however, we know that bilingual children are different, okay? When do kids start talking? Monolingual kids start producing language around 17 months old, and bilingual kids start a little bit later, 20 months old. It's still within normal developing, a uh, normal developing range, okay? So it's normal if we see that it takes a little bit longer to start talking. There are some differences. Um, bilingual children, like I said, take a little bit longer to start. And um, there are some problems when we put bilingual children in the educational system because we usually test them in English. And testing my language is giving us only a partial picture of what's going on in their minds, okay? So bilingual children know fewer words if we only test them in one language. But if we test them in both languages, they usually know more words than their monolingual counterparts. So schools should be testing really both of their, their languages. Because if we only test one of them, this could lead to misdiagnosis of a language impairment or misplacement of the kid in a program that doesn't really um, correspond to what they, they should be following. And now I'm gonna give the floor to Nicolas, who is one of our MIND students in the Bilingual MIND course, and we'll be talking about whether bilinguals are smarter. Thank you, Professor. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicholas, and I'll be presenting section four, Are Bilinguals Smarter? OK, so the bilingual advantage. So as we all, so as we um know before, bilinguals constantly go back and forth between the languages due to being due to knowing many languages. They have better attention and inhibition skills than monolinguals since they only know one language compared to bilinguals. But they can also be slower. Let's see why. <laughs> right, these pictures. Next slide, please. You you need to tell them about this one. <laughs> oh, okay. So what are, where are they? The next one. So we have. Okay, so as we talked about earlier, we have the bilinguals have the advantage over monolinguals since you know the ability to understand and comprehend different languages. So we use an, an example with like as a race on a track because the more the more fastest is the, has the more advantage. And uh, you can't see what that one is, kind of blurry. So we could we could think about, this would be the monolinguals. We have some people wow. who are really specialized in running or really mm -hmm. specialized in jumping, 
This would be bilinguals. And they are very good at doing just one thing. And bilinguals are more like, you can go on. High hurdlers. <laughs> bilinguals are more like high hurdlers since they're able to, to overcome many you know, disadvantages due to being bilingual. So they don't jump as high as the high jumpers or run as fast as the sprinters, but they are really good at combining both of their, <laughs> their skills. Yes. Okay, so how do researchers know this? So this would be a Stroop test. If you can say the color of the words to, to the left, not reading the words, just say the color each word, each word is written in, in the congruent list to, to our left. So we're gonna yeah. need one volunteer now here. That needs to unmute themselves because we're gonna do the experiment. <laughs> I have a volunteer detector too. I can go, I don't mind. Thank you, Javier. <laughs> okay, so red green red blue blue yellow green was this Very difficult good. no okay i'm scared <laughs> i have to say <laughs> okay now say the cut blue red yellow green green red yellow good job thank you extra points extra credit for me please <laughs> okay okay now, now say the color of the incongruent list the color remember uh -huh. you need to you, you don't read the word you say okay, the okay, color okay. of so, the ink so green red red blue yellow blue green nice can you but, but i had to I had, I had to take my time i had to take my time <laughs> uh-huh so what happened there why do you well, have the, the, the words comes to you more naturally than the than the the colors i assume whatever you read on screen Exactly. You have two incongruent pieces of information coming to you. Okay. But he was pretty fast at doing it. And yes. probably why Nicholas? Why was he fast? Um because he's able to switch between um linguistic and visual information. Uh-huh. And we know from research that by we know from time research better. that better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they can switch between this. The, the linguistic information, the, the word, and the visual information, the color. And this is because we have our languages active in the brain all the time, and we go back and forth between them. Okay, so this would be one of the cognitive advantages of bilingualism. Okay. You can keep going. So next slide, bilingualism has a protective effect for the brain. Practice using two languages helps to protect the brain. Research shows that bilinguals show dementia symptoms later on in life compared to monolinguals who suffer at 61 years old compared to bilinguals who suffered at 65 years old. That's four more years of good health, which is a positive on being bilingual. And, and I just want to be very precise here. This does not mean that if you're bilingual and you're prone to getting dementia, you're not going to get it. This just shows that there is a delayed onset of the dementia. A question I usually get after showing this uh, research is like, does more, do more languages add more years? And, and the research that shows that they, that's not the case. If you speak three languages, you don't get that extra four years of, of good health. Okay, now we're gonna continue talking about bilingual education. I've been reading and writing a lot about bilingual education because as Alison knows, we're preparing um, a grant with uh, Professor Rosemary Barberet. And I wanted to know uh, your thoughts on, on bilingual education. What do you think about it? If you could type in the chat or unmute yourself. So Robert says bilingual education should be celebrated, but folks need to be trained to do it right and not in a hazard way, 100%. Uh, 
Um, it is disadvantageous, is advantageous for students and institution, but requires a lot of investment that may not always be prioritized. This is very true. I'm familiar with it in the K through 12 sphere, and I think it's great. Did it for my kids. Uh, we don't do it at the college level, and that's odd. I I agree, and um, and that doesn't happen everywhere. Um, and I'm originally from Spain, and over there, like it's the trendy thing of universities in order to attract more students, they offer courses both in English and Spanish, and in some regions in their the regional languages as well. Um, and Nancy says that she believes in dual language uh, bilingualism. Awesome. I have an awesome crowd here listening to me. I wanted to show you some research on this. So here, this graph that looks very complicated, on the horizontal axis, we have grade. So from first grade until 11th grade in K through 12th education. And on the vertical axis, we have English reading scores, okay? This horizontal line, black uh, dashed line, is the average reading score for native speakers of English, okay? Kids that arrive to the U.S. without speaking English and are put into the system, obviously, when you taste their reading skills, they fall behind. They don't know English. It's very logical that they are really behind their monolingual counterparts. And here on the right, can you see my mouse when I point? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We see what happens when we put these kids in different programs. So blue is we don't, we just put them in the regular classes and we don't give them any service. And then there are different types of bilingual remedial mo models. ESL pull out, um, sometimes the teacher comes. And then we have the two enrichment models that really promote bilingualism. These remedial models, sometimes they are called bilinguals. I don't know why, because the goal is not for the kids to become bilingual. The goal is for them to learn English. Whereas the enrichment models, the two-way dual immersion or one-way dual immersion, the goal is that we have bilingual kids that are biliterate in both of their languages. And we see that they, even though they start improving, when we have all those remedial models, they never catch up with the monolingual kids. However, when we put them in these programs that reinforce their home language, I'm going to say Spanish, but they're, it could be any language. So even though they are receiving fewer hours of English, they do better than the monolingual English kids in reading English. Okay, and this is because what you learn in your first language, you're going to transfer it to your second language. So kids learning English second language learners that have a very strong first language learn better their second language. So we don't think about it as, okay, you need to do all English to do really well in school. We need to think about it. I'm going to reinforce your first language, and that's going to help you learn your second language too. And here I wanted to summarize some of the benefits of bilingual education. So for the students, we know that they have um, healthier identity formation. We enhance their cognitive flexibility that we were discussing earlier. They have enhanced communication skills, better metalinguistic awareness, which is being able to talk about the language structure. Um, they have a spending capacity to think divergently, greater creativity and healthier minds. But the benefits are not only for the students themselves. We also see benefits in their families and communities. Um, and this research was based in K through 12 education because there's no really research on bilingual bilingualism at the college level. So for their families, there is increased family cohesion, enhanced communication. They have a strong, a stronger identity, more confidence in their abilities. They become more flexible and creative thinkers. They are better problem solvers and communicators and more skilled at work, working across differences. And then going one step further, what is the benefit for, for the world? So we have great economic opportunities. We'll, I'll show you some data at the end of the presentation. 
we have increased scientific, cultural, creativity, and knowledge development, more effective international collaboration and understanding, and enhanced communication among diverse populations. Okay, so you, you see that by providing bilingual education, we're really enhancing the world at different levels. And now I'm gonna share some of the findings from the survey that the students did. The survey was their idea. I wanted them to tell you about the benefits of bilingualism. And then they had these ideas, like what if we um, actually survey our bilingual colleagues and see how they feel about being bilingual at John Jay. Okay, so in this question, was in your opinion, do you feel that bilingual students are judged more in academic settings compared to monolingual, uh, single language speaking uh, students? And you see that more than half of them say somewhat or yes. And then we let them develop a little bit more. And, and this was the answer of one of them. People perceive you as more ignorant because of your English accent. They may not verbalize that, but their actions such as over explaining something or assigning you to the easier parts of a project are clear to notice. It is appreciated when complimented about your, our accent and then they are curious about our culture. Okay, so this was some of, uh, some of their opinions. Uh, this other question, do you feel that your non-English language is less accepted in academic spaces than other types of non-English uh, languages? And we see that again, more than half of them say yes or somewhat. And uh, this was the, the opinion of one of them in class settings. If I have to write a paper on the spot without the help of grammar devices such as Word, I struggle with the right spelling or grammar in English also. In the science department, there are no resources or help for bilingual students at all. This was also reflected in another um, question. They are not really aware of what resources they, they have specific for their bilingualism. And another question here, have you ever felt pressure to not to speak your non-English language? And we see that almost half of them or half of them actually say yes. In any public setting with an abundance of white people, they get mad at you for speaking anything other than English. Also back to the family members, make fun of you for not knowing Spanish. They also make fun of you for trying either because for trying, either because you haven't tried before or your accent is work or you pronounce words wrong. It makes you not even want to try. And we see this a lot with the Heritage Speakers courses. They've received so much criticism from different parts of society that they want to give up on learning Spanish because it's obviously very humiliating when someone criticizes your, your language. And um, the last thing I wanted to share with you was related to the library. Um, we were asked that we relate our uh, presentation to the library and obviously if we're thinking about John Jay appreciating the bilingualism of uh, the students that we have having academic resources for them is very important so I think Ellis who is here was the one compiling the list for Rosemary and I and we have more than 500 books uh, in Spanish more than 4,000 ebooks, 27 journals, and more than 500 e journals in Spanish. Okay. Um, when I ask about this to our students, like, what do you think about the library and having Spanish resources? How could the library help our students? They pointed out to the bilingual staff of the library. They said, when I go to the library, people there, like the people that give me the book, are bilingual. And they appreciated that. And we have Ellis here, who is a, a bilingual librarian. And we also are going to have a new Spanish English bilingual librarian full time. I wanted, I don't know if I'm going to be able to share the sound of this, but I just found this uh, on TikTok and I thought it was very appropriate. So you let me know if you can hear it. And if not, I'll, I'll fix it. 
I cannot even finally go. find the book. Run no. over there. Okay, then I'm gonna stop sharing. No, we could hear it. You could hear it? I'm sorry, it started a little yeah. later. Okay. Then let me share. Share sound. Share. For books in the Spanish section. Finally finds a book, runs over there grown up who's working on their laptop and says, Dad, I found a book. Can you please help me read it? No, Chris, Dad Chris. looks at the book and goes, I'm really sorry, but, but buddy. Now, now I... we're seeing your uh, screen with all of us. Yeah. So not not the, oh, so, yeah, it's, it's just, just, the, just, just the other moment. screen. We're mirroring, okay. yeah. <laughs> okay. Desktop two. Third try. There's this kid looking for books in the Spanish section. Finally finds a book, runs over there growing up who's working on their laptop and says, Dad, I found a book. Can you please help me read it? The dad looks at the book and goes, I'm really sorry, buddy. I don't know any Spanish, but if you give me just a couple more minutes, I promise we'll find a book together. Kid runs back over to the Spanish section. And as they do, another kid runs up and goes, I think I know Spanish. Can, we, can I help you read this book? Both kids walk over to our little tiny couch, start reading the book. The other kid's growing up goes up to the dad and goes, I'm really sorry. My kid doesn't know a single word of Spanish. They just really like people. I'm so sorry. Dad starts laughing. The grown ups engage in conversation. Both kids are over there reading slash not really reading the Spanish book. Another kid who's been watching the whole time appears to be slightly older than the other two kids goes over to them and says, hi, I know Spanish. Can we all read the book together? The two kids scoot over, the third kid sits down, and then that kid who knows Spanish starts reading the book to the other two little kids. Um, after a few minutes, they finish the book, they all go their separate ways. The kid who knew, knew Spanish goes up there, grown up, and says, Grandma, did you see me? The grandma puts their, their arm around the kid, and they're both just smiling, big, gigantic smiles, and they both leave the library. Um, and I love it. I am now confident that library kids are going to save the world. Yes. And and I wanted to point out that that feeling that he describes at the end of the kid sharing the story with his grandma is something that we see with our students. I definitely saw it with uh, when I want to see Rosemary's students presenting their uh, research on criminal criminal criminology research methods. And their families were there and they were like really happy and proud of sharing that I am able to present research in Spanish. So this feeling is not only for the little kids going to the library, this is exactly what we see with our students. So we see that we have some resources. There's but, this kid oh, looking no, no, we've seen for this. books in this. Okay, but we could do better. And um. Um, Maria Jacoba shared, shared this with us. We do not uh, collect actively in Spanish due to the lack of funds, lack of Spanish language proficiency of our faculty, and limit of the vendors who can provide Spanish language academic materials. We're going to have a full um, Spanish speaking tenure track uh, starting this fall. And Elis Jin has been a uh, contract through summer 2024. And of course, if you know any Spanish language materials that are suitable for our collections, please let us know, okay? So we're working on it, we're getting better and we need to keep working on, on it. Okay, so summing up, I wanted to give you some cool data. More than half of the world is bilingual. So don't think about monolingualism as the, the norm. We bilinguals are the norm. And within the US, we know that there is a huge demand for bilingual workers in many different fields. Actually, nine out of 10 employers rely on employees with language skills other than English. You can see the most in demand foreign languages, Spanish being um, the greatest one, and that's the one that is most present at our school. But you see that the need is, is here. Okay, and this is data from the U.S. labor uh, market. So bilingualism is a very complex phenomenon. It has been historically used, and it is still used, to discriminate against minority communities. But we can turn that around, and promoting bilingualism 
will help us to understand the mind. And that is my research that I really love. But it can also help us to improve our teaching and to fight for justice. And that is it. So I would open the floor for questions, comments. There were some comments that I couldn't see in the, in the chat. But feel free to open the mic. We're not that, that many here. And if you want to follow um, the lab, I will be working with the students this, this year on Instagram Bilingual Mind Project. And Eva says, this is exciting as John Jay is a Hispanic serving institution. And I think it's like really funny how many of the Hispanic serving institutions don't really pay attention to the Hispanic part. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know if you have any questions for me, for Nicolas, who is still here, Robert. Hi. Yeah, this was wonderful. Really, really great presentation and very well prepared. Um, and I was just thinking about when I was an elementary school teacher. I don't know if you see the, the picture here. These were my, my students in uh, um, Los Angeles Elementary School. And they were all recent immigrants, mostly from Central America, one student from Korea. And so we all had to learn ESL and it really made me a better teacher because it helped me use different um, modalities to reach the students and to really break things down very clearly and carefully. And um, yeah, it's just, like when when you're really thinking about how people can get comprehensible input, um, it it just it just really helps, and I think it um, helps me here at John Jay a lot. And just to just to be a teacher, with regardless of who the students are, but learning those ESL techniques is, is really helpful, like manipulables and and lots of visuals, very clear clear enunciation, things like that. Thank you, thank you for sharing that that experience. Eva? No, I'm just, I'm very excited. And I, I the, you know, Perdona, I'm very excited that the, um, uh, you know, that you're, pro that you're working on this project and, and also that we're getting a, um, uh, a librarian that's going to be focused. That's just absolutely phenomenal. So I, um, how soon is the that librarian coming on board? Just out of curiosity again. So I was told that fall 2023. So as soon as tomorrow. Oh, okay, great. Because then I, I'm just my my brain is kind of clicking right now with my first year. Um, oh, tomorrow, wonderful. Because my um my I have the first year seminar, and I get many of my. Um, Latinx students that come into that class. So I would love to immediately connect them uh, so that they can uh, start taking a look at material because they're required to do a research paper anyway. So I'm very, mm -hmm. very excited. Thank you Great. so much. And her but, name, Alison, just share it, Jocelyn Castillo. Okay. It's, it's on the oh. chat. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Eva. Have you? Hi, Keith. Thank you so much. Um, so we 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 both uh, well, Christina, Aida, and I come from the modern languages and and literature department. So we usually train students on translation and interpreting. And in translation and interpreting, frequently uh, we treat our main language as our mother tongue, whereas the language from which we translate is our second language, which of course. In the example of our students here at John Jay, this is a very blurry line. I don't think that we could say that our um, students who predominantly speak Spanish, we cannot say, oh, Spanish is your mother tongue or English is your mother tongue. Sometimes it's a it's a it's a mix here. And in my very, 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 very short experience here, because I joined John Jay in, in, in January, my experience with, with students is that I could assign them to readings in English and I could assign them to readings in Spanish and I could see that they face the same challenges when tackling texts in both languages. So um, I wanted to hear about other colleagues who also work because of course we work with students who are interested in language whereas other colleagues here work with students who 
speak both languages and they use both languages in other uh, disciplinary boundaries. And I want to hear about these colleagues um, who are here in, in, this, um, in this session about how do you think students are tackling this challenge of processing these texts? Because I'm not entirely sure that it is a matter of bilingualism or linguistic ability. It's more about how are you exposed to uh, new knowledge, even if it comes in both languages, are students who are monolingual in English uh, learning faster or slower than our bilingual students? Because I, I, I really don't think so. So I'm not sure if, if a challenge for our students is the bilingualism. So aside from the benefits of bilingualism, how can we do to make our students um, get a, a better overview of what the, the readings that we have. I'm just going in circles so much. Um, um, but yeah, like how how can we, how can we, yeah, Elise is just saying the academic register is, it is its own dialect in any language. Exactly. So that's why I'm not sure that we can mirror the challenges of bilingual education in pre-K-12 stages to college uh, education where they need to grasp academic register one thing is in English, one thing in Spanish, but I've done readings of articles in French when my French is not amazing. Um, but how can we teach our students to be more analytical, no matter the language that they use in their own readings? Like, I don't know if you have any thoughts about it or anyone in the floor would like to participate. I would love to, to hear about it. There are initiatives for English that I saw last year. Tim presented. I don't know if you want to share about the English there were like different courses of English um, addressing this particular issue right Tim mm. sorry you on the spot, <laughs> the spot. <laughs> uh, not sure what you're referring to give me a little more guidance the, um, yeah I remember you gave a presentation for the mayor coordinators last year uh -huh. English for social sciences, English for... Ah, okay. So yes, got it. Um, yes, yeah, so we have a, a whole suite of courses for writing in particular disciplines. Um, so it doesn't overwhelmingly uh, uh, address the speaking issue, but the writing issue, um, uh, we have writing in the social sciences, writing in criminal justice, uh, technical mm -hmm. writing, and also writing in the humanities. And these are not required courses. So we are having lots of trouble um, having students enroll in them. Um, but uh, this semester, the two courses that made were writing in the humanities, actually three out of four of them made, writing in the humanities, writing in criminal justice and technical writing are all running with students, um, one section of each. So that's a way to, particularly for transfer students to address um, what was called in the chat, the academic register of, of the language, but um, does not really address the bilingualism side of it. But I know that's not what Javier was was asking about. So hopefully that's a, so I, I we have promoted these courses a lot. Um, uh, I can send out the course descriptions to anyone who wants them. If you wanna just email me at my John Jay email address, uh, I can send them to you. So if I remember correctly, those courses um, were created because professors noticed that uh, writing skills in English in our students were a problem. Right, particularly with transfer students, which make up more than half of our um, student population now. So um, they were designed to uh, enable um, students to have a course where they focus on writing in their discipline. So very much a high-end academic register um, kind of writing, uh, not, not redoing first year writing, um, rather one level up from that for those students who need it. So the courses have attracted both transfer students and um, resident students, for lack of a better term. Uh, but um, yeah, the, I mean, the students who have taken them have reported overwhelmingly positive experiences. The faculty have taught it, have been very pleased, but it's very difficult mm -hmm. to, um, I guess, get students to take a writing course that they're not required to take. So we're all- And that is exactly the, the same issue that we see um, at the Modern Languages Department. 
they have trouble um, using Spanish in academic. So when they are speaking familiar settings, they are very good because that's what they've been doing their entire life. But the writing, they haven't had the training. And I see it more as a literacy issue rather than as a language specific issue. So it could be uh, targeted through uh, courses for writing in English, or what we're trying to do is in our courses for heritage speakers that Rocio, who is also here as coordinating and teaching, we're trying a um, new methodology that has shown really good results, that has shown that they really advance. One advantage that we have when teaching uh, modern languages is that we have a scale of proficiency levels that I think could be applied for monolingual students too. And we can measure how much they progress in that scale, the, the actual proficiency guidelines. And research shows that with our students, um, a professor from the Graduate Center did that research a year or two ago. And she showed that they, within one semester, they went up one or two sub levels of the actual scale. So we're we're implementing that in the first semester and second semester course. But I want to uh, let Rosbelinda talk that she's been trying to say. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think my question is also echoing um, what Javier was bringing up. I, and, and I apologize if you addressed this at the beginning because I was a little bit lost in the virtual space finding the room. Um, but I, I wanted to ask about further resources to support students and all of these challenges what, that you're pointing out, which is about strengthening um, heritage languages, strengthening writing, which I think, I think we were finding out in this conversation or we're pointing out in this conversation that it's a process for all of us, no matter what our um, first language is, that it's, that it's learning another language. It's that, that, that academic register. I mean, the most I have done and have found that is very helpful is to encourage students in the languages that I can support them to use the languages, both written and oral, um, as much as they can, but uh, as much as they can and as much as I can offer support in, in those languages. But I would love to be pointed to further resources that, that can do both of those things. Because as both were pointing out, it's not the same as K through 12. We're mm -hmm. also really focusing on their writing and particular kinds of writing. Yeah, this is a conversation I've been having with Rosemary, who is also here. Uh, what you're saying about letting them use whatever language you can understand and they can produce is called translanguaging, which is one of the new uh, trends in teaching languages. So we allow them, even though if we're trying to reinforce the proficiency level in one of their languages, we allow them to use the entire repertoire and then we build with them. So we teach them, we let them, I would let them say something in English and then I help them um, to to say it in Spanish and that way we, we keep um, building. And I don't know your name, Professor Smart. Henry, it's fine. Henry. Sorry, I need to get rid of that. <laughs> um, so I've come across some students where the, the conversation about the problems that they might be having in translation and not wanting to point them in the direction of resources and them then feeling as if they're being targeted. So I am i don't know how to have those conversations uh, so much that I'm taking Spanish this semester. Um, okay. But I don't think we're having that dialogue as to how do we, the tools are there, point students in that way that don't make them feel as if they're being targeted. Does this make sense? I had a student. Can you this give us an example? Yeah. Yeah, it happened two semesters ago. The writing was pretty poor, uh, and then he started to use ChatGPT, uh, some version of that before ChatGPT had come out. So I saw a stark difference. It was like day and night. And I said, what are, what are some things that I can work on with you this semester? You just tell me one or two things, and we'll work on that. Uh, and then he told me, and I got a resource list together, and I sent it. And he was like, this is overwhelming. Like, are you trying to tell me that I, you know, I'm, you know, it, it almost as if like, hey, I'm here to help you. What do you need help with? I respond to it. And then the defenses went up. So I, I don't know how to have those conversations or if it's just here's a toolkit, go for it. 
for all of our students at the beginning of the semester. Um, and it, so the second thing is to Javier's point, in our major, we're using words as evidence, right? So we're always trying to have them build cases and not just make opinionated statements and things of that nature. So I think that is a skill that works in any language. Um, so I think it depends on the discipline um, and the objective of how you're using language. So yeah. Yeah, your first question, I don't think, because I have the impression that, that you were doing it right and maybe the student didn't take it well for whatever reason, but like we we need to help them improve. We see that their writing is poor. We it's our job to to make them improve. Um, it's a very difficult question. I don't think giving them a list of resources is probably not going to work. And we're not really trained on how to teach writing. Because if they're at the intermediate level, they can only write about basic life functions. We cannot make them jump into developing hypotheses. They need to be able to first, I don't know, be narrate and describe things. And we're not really, and I'm I'm giving you all this vocabulary because I just I'm um, getting certified to be an uh, oral proficiency interview rater. So I've learned a lot on how to, like what are the functions at each different proficiency level? So if they are here and we want them to be here, we as professors, we're not, most of us are not trained on how to, like we, we're trained to like get you from here to here. But like, if you are this low and I give you, the superior level um, assignments, it's going to be uh, really hard. So you might have to lower what you expect from them in order for them to keep progressing. Because if you give them something that is too difficult, that's just learning theories, they are not going to, they're going to feel overwhelmed and they are not going to be able to, to get there. Tim? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, I mean, Henry, you, you totally hit the nail on the head. It's the hardest thing to do. How do you um, encourage a student to get support without the student feeling labeled as remedial or not proficient or, you know, second class citizen or whatever term you want to use? Um, so one way to do that is to not make it just about the student, that particular student, but to um, incorporate uh, writing as something that all of your students have to become proficient in and make the writing center a requirement for all your students. Um, and in that way, um, the writing center, it would be easier then for you to direct the student to the ESL specific tutors at the writing center, which they do have, and which I have to say, every semester go underused. They are the only writing center tutors who are paid at the master's level. And they 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 end up just doing regular students because the ESL students are not um, coming in, in the numbers that, you know, to fill all the slots. So um, it's really hard with writing to, you know, whether it's a, uh, whether it's a, a uh, second language issue or or even just um, you know a basic writing issue to make the student want the help or be um, uh, have some self-efficacy involved and in, in improving writing on their own without making them feel dismissed or um, like they're being singled out so yeah the best way to do that is to make writing a component of the class curriculum um, and talk about it for everybody because the language issues of the second language student are one kind of language trouble we face with writing, right? But you can look at many other students in your class and see other issues. Plus, even good writers need writing center help, right? We all go to writing center tutors. We all have our colleagues that we say, read this, right? So it should not be a stigma. It should be something that's part of the um, writing process, the academic writing process. Yeah, I was just going to point that out that like the writing center could really help 
mimicking the real experience of writing because who writes a paper, writes a second version and then gets that thing published? Like, no, you go through many different iterations and then hopefully it gets published, right? Javier? Yeah, I was, I was going to circle back to Henry's um, idea because um, if we're still referring to our bilingual uh, students, I I taught a class at UCLA on how to on how to write the capstone final year um, dissertation for for the students, and one of the things that Tim was was mentioning that's what I what I, what I actually did with them that I was teaching them I was guiding them to go through the different steps of writing a piece so I was asking them to first write a, a short abstract then we're working through a a preliminary table of contents and they have drafts that they had to work on and I agree that I think that we all have to include the writing components or or we as faculty can ask can can act as mentors in terms of writing in all sorts of uh, courses I was just talking to to Rosemary this morning actually um because I'm going to be doing some sort of mini ethnographies with my translation students on how I as a translation professor still have to go through the different steps of doing this uh, research and then how to write on what they find and then in the in another course, it's how can we incentivize the way that they write in their own discipline, either in English or in Spanish, in any, in any language that we are interested in, but we need to give them guidance. It's not just about, we cannot expect them to write an essay out of the blue when, I mean, I come from Spain where we don't really write a lot of essays at university, and when I left and when I moved to the UK and I was first asked to write an essay as a PhD student, I wasn't used to writing essays. I was never taught how to write essays. So I needed to mimic the essays that I had been reading. So exposing our students to these writing, even in small scales within our own classes, no matter if it's criminology, if it's, tra if it's translation, if it's uh, law and society, anthropology, any discipline, how can we dedicate at least one or two sessions a semester on how to write a successful uh, paper in their own discipline? So yes, it is about academic language, but it's also about practicing. So if we, if we invite them to practice, if we allow them to practice with us in class, that's gonna help them quite a lot into their literacy, as you were mentioning, Christina, but also how to produce um, uh, work. And that's my opinion. <laughs> and it's already 10. So I think we're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for coming for your uh, interesting comments. And I'm going to share what the next sessions are going to be. I was instructed to show this. Thank you so much for coming. And I'll see you in lunch. Um, I'm going to John Jay now. <laughs>